right, anyway, for those of you that don't know a whole lot about me, I'm from Northwestern Illinois. We have recently moved to Kentucky Lake, very local, a few hours away from here. Uh, Y'all know where I'm from, and uh, I've been guiding up there for 15 years now. Uh, as a young kid, I chased a lot of channel cats. I feel like channel cats are kind of the gateway drug for the cat fishermen. A lot of people say bluegill are kind of the gateway drug for fishermen. Um, I say I don't necessarily recognize all the other species of fish as actual fish. Uh, I was never really born into that other pool of fishing, the crappie and the walleye and the muskie and, the, and all that. You know, I, my dad, he carried me across creeks and streams when I was two, three, four years old when I was too small to do it myself. And I'd sit on the sandbar and like a lot of people here, uh, my first experiences with fishing were uh, setting bank poles and throw lines. You know, back in the day, uh, a lot of people caught fish because they needed to eat, uh, which is, you know, is a problem I think we run into today. We're too quick to bash people. You know, I, the word we want to spread today about, about what we do in the catfishing world is uh, we want our big fish to go back, but we got to be careful to bash people that like to go fishing and keep a few fish to eat. I like to preach selective harvest. You know, take what you need, take the right size of fish, put the big fish back. Uh, I am not the kind of person that you're going to see on the internet bashing somebody because they kept a 50 pounder. I'd much rather befriend that individual, tell them what I think about it, and if I can convert them, great. But if they're not breaking the law, I'm certainly not going to uh, judge them. The internet world of catfishing has become a crap hole of nastiness, unfortunately. So what we can do uh, before I get too much more, before I get into the flatheads, we can all do our part to change that. Don't respond to drama, don't spread drama, don't start drama. The people that want to, leave that be. Catfishing was bred and born you know, with guys sitting on the riverbank around a campfire, having a good old time, catching fish, you know, taking their kids fishing, getting out a boat on the weekend with grandpa catching fish. Uh, we don't want to lose sight of what catfishing really is all about. It's all about fun. And uh, I think on the world of the internet, uh, right at the present time, a lot of people have kind of lost sight of that. And we need to get back to that. So that's the only spiel I'm gonna give you on my thoughts. I'm a selective harvest fisherman. I wanna tell you what started my passion for flathead fishing was, I actually got a call from a friend of mine one day and he's a bass fisherman. So I usually ignored his phone calls during the summer because I had absolutely no desire to go bass fishing. But he said, hey, let's take the bass boat out, we'll catch some live bait and we'll go flathead fishing. I was all about that. At the time, I was, Oh, I was in my late teen years, early 20, you know, uh, and I had done some flathead. I'd caught a lot of flatheads at that time, but I had not started targeting flatheads yet. So I went with him, we, we netted some shad, and we're gonna talk a lot about shad today. I had netted some shad, and all I had to fish with that day was a couple of Zebco rhinos, because up until that time, a lot of my, a lot of my fishing was channel cat fishing. So I get my Zebco rhinos, I hop in his, uh, I think it was a Triton bass boat. We scoot up the water way too fast. And uh, we get up there and we fish around, you know, we caught a couple little flatheads and then, you know, finally I get this pop on the end of my line. And I didn't recognize what that pop was. I mean, I was, you know, this 25, 30 years ago. I, I didn't know what that pop was. And then the fish started to pull over, you know, so I'm, I'm standing there and this fish takes me down to the water and I rip back and I miss him clean. You know, so I'm thinking, well, you know. So anyway, I run back, I grab another shad, I throw it out there, and within two minutes, uh, the fish picks that bait up again. And this time I'm not gonna miss, so I, I do one of them Mike Iaconelli bull crap things he does, and I run up to the front of the boat, and I follow this fish all the way down the boat, and I get to the back of the boat, and I set the hook with everything I got. I snap the rhino, I, <laughs> I snapped this Zebco rhino off about right here, but I hooked the fish. So now I'm sitting there with a, a Zebco rhino that's got about I like three pounds of drag, 
and I've got a jagged edge on my rod and I've got one line guide. So I got this bait handed reel and I look like somebody the first time they pick up, you know, they, they got their, uh, their spinning reels upright. I'm reeling my bait caster this way and I'm fighting this flathead, you know. And flathead's wearing me out. My back hurts because I don't have any of the rod to wear the, the fish out. I fight this fish and I fight this fish and I fight this fish and finally I land it. And uh, if you've ever seen, how many of you knew me back when I had the Catfish Academy? I knew you did. And, um, if you ever find that on Facebook, you'll see uh, there's, a, there's a flathead on there. And I, my guide service has been called Flathead Freaks. Uh, this fish, as soon as I seen it, I, I, that's what I yelled. I said, man, that thing's a freak. You know, so I, you know, I had a, a replica of that fish made. I've still got that fish. I was actually going to bring it today. We didn't, we didn't bring it, but, um, but I wanted to tell you that story. Anyway, I landed that fish, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I got rid of my Zebco rhinos. Uh, I had one and a half left <laughs> at the end of that day. So I, I, got, I got rid of those and I started upgrading and um, when I say upgrade, and that's what we're going to move into next, uh, I have worked for companies, I've worked for G3CR, I've worked for a lot of these uh, boat companies and the biggest argument you get into on flathead fishing is what's the most important thing that can make you a better flathead fisherman that can help you catch more fish. I've been fishing for catfish for 43 years I didn't jump on the internet three years ago and post 10 pictures and say, I'm, I'm good. I've been doing this a long, long time. And a lot of people will debate what it is. What's the best bait to use? What's the best tackle to use? I can tell you that if you go down there and buy an Alumacraft, a Sea Arc, a Procat XL, I can guarantee you that none of that boat, none of them boats, any boat manufacturer out there, you can get any one you want. None of them will catch more flathead for you or catfish, period, okay? They're all nice products. You can buy one, but a boat doesn't catch you fish, okay? But I will tell you, in my opinion, over the years, if you're a boat fisherman about targeting flathead catfish, where you put your boat will catch you more fish. And I'm going to show you, a lot of people say, bait's the most important thing about flathead fishing. Time of the day or night is the most important thing about flathead fishing. Uh, you got to use a broomstick pole and a 100 pound braid and 15 out of hooks. That's the most important thing. The most important thing is boat position and where you put your baits. Anybody says any different, send them to me and me and him will argue all day and then we'll just agree to disagree, you know, because we all have our own opinion. Where you put your boat dictates where you put your bait. And with flathead fishing most of the year, where you put your bait and your boat dictates if you're gonna catch big flatheads on a regular basis. Now, <clears throat> I wanna give you a heads up before I try to illustrate a couple of these for you. I am the world's suckiest artist. If you, any of you know a sucky artist, I'd be right there below them. Okay, well, I'll, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> You ain't seen me draw yet. Okay, I'm gonna whip up something here for you, and believe me, I'm not trying to draw no piece de resistance, but feedback just killing me. You're gonna, oh man, it's gonna be bad. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, do that, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this oh no that looks too much like a oh yeah we can't do that all right here we go all right this is that's not supposed to be a fish so don't say man you are bad okay i'm going to give you an idea what this is here real quick i really like doing this i know some people have them fancy uh you know little screen things they do through but i really like being able to draw because i feel like you get more out of it and you can also tell people, man, that guy could talk, but he couldn't draw worth a crap. This is a tree laying in the water, correct? Can you see that? 
All right, root ball, tree trunk, limbs. I think it's perfectly fine, pretty all right. Arrows dictating the current flow, okay? Where would you want to anchor your boat? Here, 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 okay. If you see this root ball and you can visually see it, it's an external piece of cover, it's sticking up. And you can see, you can clearly watch the water and see which way the current's flowing, okay? You don't, if you have a cross flow on that log, you don't want to center your boat on that log. If you've got flow this way, okay? Because you're gonna throw this bait on this root ball and you wanna put baits. I like to throw my baits off about two feet. By the time they settle the current, they're gonna float right in here. That's where you want them, okay? But if you have current flowing this way, and you throw a bait here, and it floats in here, you can still catch that fish, but good luck getting him out of there. You know what I'm saying? So boat position means a lot, not only where your baits are gonna be, but if you can get the fish out of there. But if any of you have caught big flatheads, you know you need everything working in your favor. You want every possible variable to be in your favor. You know, you want your line in good shape, you want your hook sharp, you want your boat in the right position, you want, you want everything right. So this di dictates a ton. Don't just find your cover, your submerged cover, or your, your external cover, and just center your boat on it and think that's good. Make sure you pay attention to your current flow. You wanna make sure, because if the current flow is, again, crossways in any way, you're gonna have one bait that's not gonna be where you want it. Take the extra time, even if you have to, I'm gonna do more fantastic illustrations later, just in case you missed this one already. Um, just in case you hook a big fish, you need to be in the right position. Also, again, when you get, when you get right with the current, it allows you to put your bait in the right position. Now in front of cover like this, you almost always have a cup. I call it a cup. Some of you probably know this if you've done some flathead fishing. You know that a lot of times right here, in front of your root ball, you'll get a cup. And that's from water rolling. Almost like water when it comes over a dam and it churns, you get your scour out holes, which are a great place to catch flatheads occasionally. You'll get a hole here. This can be a great place for baits. This is a great place for baits. Okay? A lot of these flathead. How many of you caught flathead and they have right back just behind their gill plates, they're skinned up? They got marks on them. Okay? They feel real secure under cover, okay? They love that. Now again, when people, when we talk fishing, I never talk in absolutes. In other words, I'm not gonna tell you that every catfish you catch in post-spawn that is set up on cover, that they're all gonna be set up on cover and feeding. There's always exceptions to everything, okay? There's always an exception. There's always that one rogue fish out there swimming around that somebody catches, you know, and they're like, well, you said you catch all your flathead on cover. That don't mean you can't catch one random up on a flat feeding. That don't mean out on a ledge or something. What we're talking about when we say this kind of stuff is these are their tendencies. Following me? Any questions yet? Not one question. You guys are good, man. Yes, sir. What did he say? Yeah, in reservoirs you get into a, I mean, a, you get into a whole ball, of, different ball of wax. Uh, when they go dead, when there's no current, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you. I know. I mean. That, that can be confusing. Those fish can do a million different things. If there's current, I'm gonna find cover within that current or a ledge within that current 
or my favorite illustration, which I was getting ready to get to. I brought another board here somewhere. That's all right, I'll just use my hand. Hell, I'm a redneck anyway, we don't care. All right. In a reservoir or a river, if you don't have cover, say you don't have cover, this is your, can you see that red? We'll go back and black. Anybody know where I put my black marker? All you guys out there, nobody watched where I put my marker at? You're, some, you're my support network. We're gonna go with red. Thank you. Red. So you got your river bank. Sometimes your holes run close to the bank, say like on an outside bend, right? You got shallow water leading into your drop off, okay? Corners of holes are awesome. That's a corner, that's a corner. A mid-river hole like this. So you got a flat up here, flat over here, and your hole's out here. Corners. Doesn't mean you won't catch a big flathead here, 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 or even throwing one up on the on the flat. But these are your likely your tendencies, the places I would target, even in a reservoir. Did that, good? Again, like I said, current dictates a lot of that, so that can, go, that can go a lot of different ways. And I know the last few years, the last few years we've had, no matter where you were in the country, we've just had so much change. I mean, high water, low water, um, cold water, warm water. I've seen there's houses falling into the dang Tennessee River down there Right, I mean, I know the first, th this is not being insensitive, but you know, anytime a cat fisherman hears of a house falling into the river or a barge sinking, we're like, cover. You know, we hope they're okay, and then we're thinking, man, I can't wait to fish that. You know, it, it's, again, I'm not being insensitive, I'm saying, you know, the damage is done, so now they're in there, and you know, you hope everybody's all right and stuff, but you're thinking, cover. You know, so anyway, let's move on to some of the tools because that's a big, and this young lady here, she's got to buy this rattle from me afterwards because she already touched it. So we're going to get into some of the tools of catfishing. Hot topic on the internet right now. So hot that I mean people argue over it. You know, there's products on the market, uh, dragon chubs. Uh, demon dragons, uh, all kinds of rattles and modifications, okay? There's a lot of that stuff on the internet. Um, you don't need all that stuff to catch fish. You don't need all that stuff. We've been running offshore tackle planer boards. One of the owners of the company is sitting right over here, Nick Deshano. His dad, by the way, just got, just got inducted into the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame. Uh, so if you don't think they know their stuff, you know, um, so there's a lots of tools, right? There's a lots of arguments uh, about, do you need these things? N no, not, no, not really. Do you, do you need to have, a, if you come to me and say, Matt, we're, we're leaving here this afternoon and we're gonna go over here to the Ohio River and we wanna catch flatheads um, or blue cats, we just wanna go fishing. Do I need to run a planer board do I need to have a, a demon dragon? Do I need to have... No, you don't need to, necessarily. Okay. But they're tools. How many days have you spent out fishing and you got done fishing and you said, they're just, they're just not doing it today? Every one of you didn't raise your hands a liar. You're all, you're all a bunch of... I have to get Steve back over here. I thought they screened you guys better at the door, but apparently you all liars. Okay, we have all done that. 
We have all said that. I don't care who you are. We've said it. Those are the days when adding a rattle to your live bait, adding a rattle to your cut bait, using planer boards and spreading your baits out and maybe suspending them a little bit. Maybe those little differences are the things you want to have available in your boat. Nobody is saying that you have to buy planer boards to catch more catfish. Nobody is saying you have to buy rattles, this rod holder, that boat, that to catch fish, they're tools. Okay, it's an option to give you to make you better and more proficient at what you're doing, okay? So don't think that you were trying to force this stuff down your throat. The, the thought of running planer boards for catfish was very, I mean, it's almost, it almost sounded ridiculous to a lot of people 10 years ago. And even up until four or five years ago, it was still like, you know, I think people look at you sometimes and think you ain't playing with a full deck. You know, and I, I mean, I, I'm the first one to admit that I'm not. But, you know, planer boards, you know, they're for, the little planer boards are for crappie. And, and this is a walleye and a muskie and a salmon and a, it's, it, that's what they're for, right? But no, catfish are very aggressive, okay? And planer boards ran right, and, and it's all about depth, it's all about speed. But if you're fishing in current, okay, and you're gonna anchor fish, sir, if you fall asleep, we'll have you removed from the building. I'm just kidding, you take a nap. It's all right, I'm boring, but okay. So if you're sitting in the back of your boat and you're fishing in heavy current and you've got two, two poles thrown way out the back, you've got two thrown a little shorter, maybe you've got a couple suspended. Down here in the lower half of the country, these guys can use like 80 rods. I mean, they look like shrimp trawls when they're out there catfishing. Up where we're from, we use two apiece. You know, so I think we're much better fishermen. Us Yankees are much better fishermen. Uh, but, you know, uh, so, you, so you've got these, and you're not catching fish. And you're fishing the corner of the hole, and you're fishing the front of the hole, and you're fishing right in the heart of the hole. Nothing. What can you do without a tool to see if it works, okay? What can you do with a rattle then that can add something to it? Flatheads, channel cats, blue cats, I'm talking flatheads today. Flatheads love vibration. Have y'all ever heard of the ampullae of Lorenzini? The ampullae of Lorenzini was a study done on great white sharks about the gel-filled pits in their chin that allow them to to find bait through the power of electroreception. There's a fish in fresh water that also has that and it's called the flathead catfish. The flathead catfish and the catfish as a whole are, are the most sensory percept fish in fresh water. When we take a fish out of, we take one of them fish out of the water people, we've done it so many times we take it for granted, but these fish are amazing. Catfish are freaking amazing, you know. You know, you, you get tired, but anyway, don't get me off on that whole subject because I get all fired up and whatnot. Anyway, you're not catching anything. It's the perfect time to learn something. You're targeting this piece of cover. You're targeting the corner of the hole. No flathead bite. What, what tools do I have without moving my boat in this current, in this river, that I can change something up and see if it helps? Well, I can reel them in. And I can throw a rattle on, yeah? I can throw a rattle on, see if the vibration and the movement in tight. Flatheads are stubborn. Guys, they're like your women. They don't listen, you know? They're gonna, they're gonna fight you on things, you're gonna have arguments, you know how it is. We, we, we're all married, most of us are married men, we know how it is. It's a battle, they're stubborn, okay. Sometimes, you gotta sweeten the pot a little bit. Flatheads do what they want, when they want, period. I've had baits and I know, and I, I prefer a huge, I like to use big baits, and when a lot of guys say big baits, they're talking eight to 12 inches and stuff. I'm not, you know, we're gonna talk baits here in just a second, because that'll lead into a lot of other things, and then I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of questions and a lot of things to talk about. 
If you don't have tools in your boat, something else to try, you're never going to know if it works. So at some point you're going to get tired of hearing these guys say, well, we, we had a good day today. Okay? That's when sound, vibration, did the mic just go dead? Hello? We got no mic. We got no mic. Got a power outage. Yo! Hello? 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 I think their whole system went down. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right then, we'll just move on. That's kind of like waking up in the morning and it's rainy. You either go fishing or, you know. So anyway, this here, we had, a, we had a mic failure, kid. Where were you? I'm dying over here. All right, let me see. Uh, if you want to use the mic, you can. I would rather use the mic so I don't have to yell. Break out my guitar. Of course, you don't want to hear that either. There you go. How's that? All right. I wrote this one for you. This one's called Flathead Catfish Kick Ass. <laughs> All right, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, that was pretty funny. I work on stuff like that occasionally. But most of them don't work out so well. I'm glad I got one laugh today. All right. I'm going to demonstrate for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Me and Shell were, we were experiencing some of these, exactly what I was talking about down in Memphis, Mississippi River Monsters Tournament a year and a half ago or so. You trying to get me another dry erase marker? Dude, you, you rock. Thank you very much. You're looking out for me. That's what cat fishermen do. We gotta look out for each other. Uh, so me and Michelle, we were, we were struggling. You know, a lot of us from the north, we don't have a lot of experience catching blue cats. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of water down in the southern part of the, of the country, you know, and I'm really proficient at finding flatheads. And we were finding flatheads, but, you know, it's very tough to anchor. Uh, there's a lot of current down there. There's a lot of current seams, things that make things tough. So we switched, you know, we, we, were, we switched to rattles and this planer board. These are the offshore tackle planer boards. Their booth is right over yonder by the window. What's your booth number, Nick? Three. Okay, Nick is not paying me to say any of this stuff I'm saying, by the way. I'm just telling you. These are a magnificent tool to have in your boat. And I'm gonna tell you why. We're so you're sitting in heavy current, okay? And you're fishing your, your typical set out behind your boat. With an offshore planer board, I can take this, and this is actually a right, so this would run this way. It's right looking at, as you're looking at me, it's right, okay? So I'm fishing back here, and I've pretty much got my spread out back here, and I've got, you know, I got about 30 foot covered, pretty good. We only were running 14, 16 ounces of weight. But now I've got a, a rock bank up here, and I know that that rock bank comes down in about 12 foot of water, those rocks meet the hard bottom and they form a rocky ledge, not a river ledge, a riprap ledge, right? So I can do, I can reel in everything and I can move over there. Or I can hook up. And a lot of people find, a lot of people find planer boards intimidating. I mean, you just look at them and you're like, a lot of people think, where do I start? You know, I think that's the, I think that's the problem. But anyway, I can take this planer board, hook it up, 
and I can let the current do the work for me. Okay. This planer board now rigged up. You got to put a little slack in here. I didn't put any slack in here. What'd you get me, pal? You're back. Oh, you just rock, man. You're awesome. I'll play another song for you when you come back. All right, I'm going to tune up. I got two guitars with me. Okay, so now you've got your offshore tackle planer board rigged up, right? We're obviously going to run it deeper than this. There's several different sizes of these depending on how much weight you're going to run. It all depends on how much weight you're going to run. And again, if you follow me back to the booth, or if you really, really, really want to know more about these planer boards and how they work, go over to the offshore tackle booth and check it out. So what this allows me to do now, without moving, I can reel in four of these rods, say, add some, change some fresh bait, maybe change my bait style completely. Maybe change from live bait to a cut bait, correct? Or vice versa, freshen up the bait I got. Maybe if I've got live bluegill out, I need to go to live shad, or I need to go to live moon eye, or I need to go to a live carp, okay? And what this, this does, is allowing me right over there with that, see that young lady over there in the gray, the gray sweatshirt? Now I'm sitting here in six mile an hour current, facing that way out the back of my boat. But with this planer board, I can put a bait there in six mile an hour current. I don't have to reel all my junk in. I don't have to move my boat, but I can try this tool that I had in my boat. Not because I had to have it to catch fish, not because somebody that you look up to is trying to force it down your throat, but because it's another tool that can be huge. So what I would do is, prior to coming into this area, I would have an, I would have an estimated guess of how deep this is where these rocks meet the hard bottom, okay? What we were doing at Memphis is we had an area, a long area that was about 12, 13 feet deep where that rocky ledge was, and then it was a flat that dropped off into about 60 feet. So we were fishing this ledge on a current seam. And what we found out was, if I set a bait about 12 foot deep on one of the offshore tackle pro mags, the big, the big boards, I could run it right over, and when that weight hit them rocks, the planer board would stop. So now I've got a bait laying right where the flat and the rocky ledge met, okay? There is no other way to do that without going up there and anchoring on the bank. And in some situations, you don't want to anchor up there in that kind of current, that kind of water on the rocks with your boat because you're gonna, your boat's gonna take a pretty good beating. So now, I've sat here for 30 minutes, I've not caught a fish. But now, I've put fresh bait out, I've added different bait, I have added vibration and sound, and I have expanded my coverage area by about 50 feet on both sides. So now I can pretty much, that's a fresh hole now, right? I can, I can give that another 20, 30 minutes. Is that gonna work for you every time? Absolutely not. So you never speak in absolutes when it comes to fishing because nothing seems to happen the same way every time. However, you gotta have the tools in your boat. Again, this planer boards right over there, offshore tackle booth. Tell them I sent you. Only reason I'm pointing that out to you enough is because the owner has a lot, lot more experience with the boards than I do. Even if you don't want to buy one, if you want to learn a lot more about them, go over there and check them out. This right here, when it all comes down to it, I've caught 85, 80 to 85 percent of the flathead catfish I've caught in my life, I've caught on this rig right here. Everybody in here has tied this rig. It's a Carolina with a no roll, slip sinker rig with a, right down to your hook. 
Okay. We know according to current, speed, cover, all that good juju stuff, that we can adjust the length of this leader to let our bait move more or less, right? It doesn't make a difference if you like to use 50 pound main, 40 pound leader line. I like to use the same throughout. I believe the word for that is homogenous. That's the biggest word I've ever used in seminar. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of surprised I remembered it. Do you still want to go on a guide trip, even after listening to me up here? Uh, anyway, this can be adjusted a million ways to make the, same, the regular old Carolina rig much more effective. Like I said, you can adjust leader length according to cover, according to conditions. Flatheads don't like to feed much when the water temperature gets below 47, 50 degrees, okay? Get on the internet and say that and you'll spark a debate in a firestorm, the likes of which most of you have never seen. People are very sensitive about that. Uh, I don't like to disturb flathead. They get pretty much lethargic after 47 to 50 degrees. You can catch them. You're gonna snag quite a few of them. Uh, and I prefer to just leave them be. I like flatheads more than I like people. I just like to leave them be. Except you, Nick. You're all right. You too, Shell. Yeah, thanks. But other than that, you know, I like flathead that much. As you can tell by listening to me, I spend a lot of time alone. Right? You know, yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with myself in the boat. If you're a flathead fisherman and you really want to be good at it, and you really want to catch big fish consistently, you can watch a lot of YouTube. These are things we didn't have when we were kids. These people nowadays can learn how to be really good fishermen and learn a lot of tips, and you can, you, can become, you can become a very proficient fisherman in a matter of a season. You know, a lot of these people, you can get on the internet, you can watch YouTube videos, you can see the rigs, you can see the people are putting charts up there, you can, you can see what ledges look like, and the tighter the ISO bars are together, you know it's a steeper drop in the wind, and there's just a ton of things. You start to learn when you go flathead fishing, you start to learn to watch the weather the night before. I don't watch the weather for fronts and moon phases and things along that line per se, because I've been a guide for 15 years. I gotta find a fish for somebody regardless of where the moon's at, regardless of what the wind direction is, but finding out the wind direction, I believe is the most important thing the night before a trip. If you have options, and you know you're gonna be fighting a 30 mile an hour wind, I wanna know that in advance. I'm gonna fish, fish a certain section of a river based on the wind direction alone. Because again, fishing flatheads, especially during the summer months when they're set up on cover, is all about bait placement and boat placement. And if the wind is messing with you, and you didn't check the weather the night before, and you're already out there and you're like, man, if we would have put in 20 miles upstream, that stretch of the river would have been out of the wind, and we could have sat, and we could have better baits with our one of them, and we'd have had a better day. So that's a big deal. Watch the weather before you go fishing. I know you're all, you know, temperature means a lot, and, and all that stuff means a lot too. Water temperature means a lot. I'm interested the night before I go in wind direction. And if it's cool outside, and I'm going flathead fishing, and I'm, I'm gonna be fishing tight to cover, and I don't watch the weather, I know what's going to happen the next day. I'm going to be swinging back and forth in front of a piece of cover, snagging all my stuff up, and I'm going to be making up new cuss words. And it could have all been avoided had I watched the weatherman. Now, weathermen, I know, have a strong tendency to be liars. I mean, they lie through their teeth. They're wrong. First of all, is there any weathermen in here? No meteorologists in here? Okay, weathermen are horrid lying individuals and you can almost never trust them that's why you, you should always have a backup plan if you do get stuck and you really want to go fishing and you're gonna go flathead fishing you get out there and the winds really bad things are really rough and you, you you're forced per se some of you you know some of us will We'll just wear more clothes, right? And we'll just stick to the we'll just stick to the plan. But if you do have to lose, there's other things you can look for 
for flatheads other than just cover. Number one thing for flat thing that I would encourage you to look for is big singular pieces of cover. One piece, not a brush pile, not a huge log jam, one singular piece of cover. A big flathead will take refuge on a place like that. He will call it home. He won't always be active. He won't always be in the root ball. You won't always get him to bite. But it's the best place, whether it's a rock or a piece of wood or whatever it is, a singular piece of... The flatheads don't know how big they are. They just know what they like. And over years of trial and error, I know singular pieces of cover will produce big fish. Okay? Then number two, you can move on. You can move on down the line and on the line. But you, they like rock. They like wood. They like bridge pillars. You know, you see bridges are like magnets for fishermen, right? But it's the cover that, that flathead that a lot of people don't see or they don't take the time to look for that are the most productive. Now you have a hole, a rock the size of my head, of course I've got a great big old quad of head, but a rock the size of my head can hold the biggest fish, the biggest flathead in the whole system. Okay. Now the other big thing that will touch off a firestorm with flatheads that I'm going to clear up for you. <clears throat> People say flatheads are territorial. They're solemn critters. They don't like other people being around. You know, if you find a big fish, he's going to be alone. He's going to run everything off. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard about flatheads. Flatheads are no more territorial than blue cats and channel cats. They're all, during the spawn, they are. But let me ask you this. Now, this is serious. Do you want another man in your bedroom when you're with your wife? Why didn't anybody say no? Are you all sick? Uh, whatever. Maybe it's a southern thing. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just talking. All right, whatever. During the spawn, all fish are territorial. Channel cats are territorial, flatheads are, blue cats are, crappie are, them little blue things, bluegill, they are, bait fish, they're all territorial, right? Post spawn, the only thing about a flathead that's territorial in post spawn is, if there's a big log in the river that he likes to feed on, he's going to be in the best spot on that log to feed. If he's not active, if he ate a three pound carp last night and he's not really active, he may be laying back on that log, underneath the limb, just chilling out, right? And there might be a smaller fish up on that root ball in the spot you would call the active spot, right? That don't mean the big fish isn't there. He's just not active at that time. If he wants to feed there, he'll feed there. That's when, yeah, he'll, He'll run anything else off that's there. But to call a flathead territorial and say, you know, where you find a, ter a flathead, you'll never catch a channel cat, you'll never catch a blue. <clears throat> it's just not true. It, ha it does happen. Again, so I find that a little, a little weird. But in fishermen, all y'all watch in fishermen videos. Again, you're a bunch of liars. Nobody raise their hand again. Y'all got sore arms or something happened? Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit of a complex. Like, is this thing on? I played that song for y'all, and y'all thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, in Fisherman, in the dawn of the flathead with their big cat safari, right? They, they hadn't really got into flatheading yet. And they started a lot of misconceptions about flatheading and it cost a lot of people a lot of nights of sleep. Because one of the first things they said is, the big fish come out at night, right? How many of you still believe, or still prefer, let's not go with believe, let's go with prefer to fish at night for flatheads. And is that because you just enjoy fishing at night or is that because you feel like that's when your best chance to catch a big one is?
just a personal, you just like to fish at night. You know, for years, when this first, you know, when the flathead, when more and more people started to get into this flathead movement, you know, I've been a guide for 15 years. People still call me today and say, we're going at night, what time do I need? And they're shocked when I tell them I don't fish for them at night. I said, why? I say, they say, well, why? You know, I mean, they, they act like they're, they're pretty dumbfounded by that. You know, but I can tell you, they are a structure oriented. Any of you got, now would you please raise your damn hands when I say, thank you, sir, you're awesome. But wait till I answer the question next time. You're way ahead of the game. How many of y'all hunt deer? Gosh dang it, we got you. I love you got right here, right here. You guys rock. Okay, if there's an animal on the face of the planet that I could compare a flathead catfish to, it's a white-tailed deer. And that's weird, considering one lives on land and one doesn't and, and all that good thing. But you know, they're very cover-oriented. In a lot of situations, yes, dear? Will they move into the shallow water at night to feed? Yeah, they will. Um, what was I talking about? You you disrupted my whole flow. Deer, yeah, deer. Deer, yeah. So deer, you know, they have they they have a small home range a lot of times, except during the the rut, right? They're very cover oriented. We've learned over the years that a great time to to shoot a big deer, or catch, you know, it, we don't catch deers down here, do you? Because I that just drives me nuts. Okay, nobody's catching deers. All right. We find out now that some of the best time to target deer is what? Middle of the day? Because they have us patterned, right? I catch most of my flatheads middle of the day. Why is that? Why do I prefer that? Number one, I love getting into that heavy cover and fishing. I just, I just enjoy it. There's nothing better than finding a piece of cover, buried where nobody else is looking, getting your boat anchored up on it, getting baits on it, you know, but the main reason why I enjoy targeting mostly during the day is because I know where they're at. Okay, I know there's times during the year, pre-spawn, the fall movement, wintering months when they move around quite a bit, to and from areas, right? But for the most part, I know where they're at during the day. They're in the cover. Nighttime, they move all over the place. A lot of them will move shallow. That's why so many guys catch them up on the bank, maybe on throw lines or bank holes or whatever. I don't even, I don't talk about that stuff much. You know, they, they do. If they're gonna move around, it's gonna be, you know, they move around mostly at night. I'd rather go after them in the day in the cover, okay? I know they're there. I know if I target eight or 10 or 12 really good pieces of cover with good bait, Odds are in my favor of catching good fish. Yeah? I mean, one thing we can't do with fishing is make it harder than what it is. There's going to be days when they win. Correct? I mean, there's days you tip your hat to them and say, you know what, you little, you know, you insert your own personal swear word in there. But they just win. You know, you try all the cover, you, you change baits, you try your offshore planer boards, you, you put on some rattles, you know, and it's just not your day. They're just shut off or whatever. You just tip your cap to them. So let's get into bait a little bit. Sir, if you take one more step, I'll have you flogged. And I even know you guys and you're still walking out. You're leaving my seminar for an in-law? <laughs> Don't you ever come back. You better be here tomorrow, noon. I'm, I'm not a very big fan of yours no more. All right, no, it's okay. You just go. I'm hurt. I'm hurt now. Oh, yeah, yeah I did. See ya, honey. All right. So let's talk bait a little bit. Bait's a, a pretty hot topic with people. You know, uh, everybody has their own preference. It seems like overwhelmingly on the internet anyway it's all about 
bluegill for a lot of people or bream as you call them down here right brim bream bros whatever brim okay i'm not trying to insult you all down here it's just you know it's a tough learning that i talked I, I was fishing with people that kept talking about catching perch and they kept talking and i thought this was a new species see i we have yellow ring perch up where we're from okay and i'm thinking this guy here knows some stuff because i have never I'm waiting to, for us to catch one of these mysterious perch, right? Well, I, I opened my live well, and I've got 15 bluegill in there. And he said, well, you already got some. I said, what in the hell are you talking about? He said, perch. I said, brother, those are not perch. Those are brim bluegill. He said, they're perch. I mean, I ain't never been taken back as much in a boat it, anyway, we'll get off that. But it seems like the big thing, you know, your number one choice of baits for a lot of people is bluegill. And that's because they're easy to get. They're a good bait. They're a hardy bait. They live pretty well. All right. What is my, I mean, if you were to ask me, what, somebody please ask me a question and ask me, you guys, man, you guys are on it. Now, I like it. You're on it. You guys have learned very well. I've had three people removed already. You don't want to be next. You don't get refunded. You can't come back. All right. If I had my choice, if, if the Lord came down, and, and I believe the Lord has a lot to do with a lot of things, and I'd rather have Him on my side than luck any day. But... If I could magically walk out to my boat every day and there'd be 30 live baits in my live well, and I, every day, it would be 15 to 20 inch shad. Okay? Everywhere, anywhere. And I know people will argue with you, but let them. Get the biggest shad you can get. Now you'll see around, there's a lot of bait tanks down here. There's a lot of stuff to keep shad alive. Fortunately for you all, I don't work for any of those companies. So I'm going to tell you, don't be intimidated by keeping shad alive because it's very easy. Okay? If you put a little work into it, you can keep shad alive. People freak out. Okay? It's very, no. You got to temper your shad, get 10, put them in a five gallon bucket. A shad's natural response to being scared is to throw their scales and just puke. That throws predators off their scent trail, okay? Temper them in a bucket for a while. When that bucket water gets dirty, take those fish, put them in another bucket. Now I know it, you're saying, how many freaking buckets I gotta take in my boat to do this? Just two. Dump out that first bucket, put some fresh water in. Temper them two or three times. And eventually, you'll have 10 in a bucket and that water won't be getting dirty no more. They'll be nice and settled. Then take them, put them in your live well, and they'll live. I've kept, I keep them alive in my live well sometimes for eight to 10 days. No $800 tank, no, no care products. Change out the water, keep the water cool, okay? If you temper them and keep that water clean and cool, you can keep shad alive. Now, again, no offense to these companies selling tanks because they, they work very well and they can help a lot of you reach that goal. Yes, sir? And that's a big point. Uh, when the water temperature gets up over 75 into the 80s, it's a lot more work. You gotta keep the water clean a lot more because once it starts to warm, if you let the water warm, especially when you take them out of warm water, they will die. Just how hard, you're, how hard you wanna work to keep them alive is up to you. Uh, to me, it's worth it because I know how good of a bait it is. I know, and I, I really believe it. I threw a 15 inch, live shad in front of a root ball one day and I caught a I think a 27 28 pound flathead was you know which is still a, a nice fish he had a 15 inch walleye sticking out of his belly and he ate that shad anyway you know that's like me over at the golden corral <laughs> you know what I'm saying I'm still chewing up four or five shrimp and I got a piece of fish and, you know I mean again I think and I think that's why we don't see a lot of 80, 90, 100 pound flathead being caught. 
I really believe there's a lot of them out there. I just feel like they're eating such big baits and we're not doing that. I feel like they're, using, they're eating a giant bait and they're only feeding once every two, three, four days. You know, I feel like they'll run down five, 10, 15 pound fish, they eat one, and then they don't feed again for six days. So if you ain't throwing a bait that big, you know, I, I feel like, you know, there'll be some bigger ones caught, but I really feel like with flatheads, you see the blues are just dumb. You know, blues are dumb. They just run around and go, hey Fred, look at that. They swallow up a big, you know, they, they don't know no better. They just float around the river and they eat anything to fly, you know. Flatheads are a very more advanced species of catfish. And they, they you know, they go for the filet mignon, not what's just bumping down the river, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, that's, that's my belief on why you're not seeing, because we're seeing bigger and bigger and more and more blues being caught, right? And I, I, the reason why a lot of people ask, you know, I get that asked a lot of time, why are we not seeing the giant flatheads being caught, 80, 90, 100 and bigger? Uh, I think part of the answer is we're not throwing those sizes of baits and most people are not gonna, I don't even. Uh, and pay lakes which we can, you know, we can talk about or we cannot talk about, you know, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Now, I'd like to open up the floor because I know somebody's got to have some question because I've been running off the mouth for a while. Yes, sir. I, I am not, I will double hook my bait, but I don't move for flatheads. I fish on the rope all the time. On the rope means anchored, okay? so. I don't double hook them, and believe this or not, the bigger the bait I use, the better my hookup rate is. And it, it, it's like, they are not gonna play with a 15 or 18 inch bait. They're gonna inhale it, and the head's gonna be down here, and the tail's gonna be inside their mouth, and when you, when you set a hook, I rarely miss a fish on a great big bait, but I miss fish on small baits a lot. So no, you're dragging, drifting, that kind of stuff. I mean, a lot of them fish you're seeing being caught that on those guys that are dragging and drifting are, they're not targeting flatheads. That just happens to be what they caught that day. Yes, ma'am. So do you have to use a certain hook to picture? That's another issue we didn't get to with the uh, uh, catfish and his style of hook. I know circle hooks have kind of taken all over the market uh, lately. I do not advise circle hooks for flatheads for a lot of reasons, but the main reason is the style of the way I fish for flatheads. When I'm targeting a flathead on this, you know, the root ball that's right here, 10 feet behind me, okay? And I'm targeting a flathead. I'm, I'm putting my chips in the middle, right, that he is on one side of that root ball. When he inhales that bait, he is not going anywhere, okay? A lot of these flatheads suck in your bait, you see the pop on your rod, it goes over a little bit, maybe a little bit more, and that's all you get a lot of times. With a circle hook, in that situation, mark my, remember my words, in that situation, you have no chance to hook that fish, okay? A circle, he needs to turn and move away from you so that hook rotates into the corner of the mouth. Okay? If you're gonna start targeting flathead to catch, specifically catch bigger and more flathead on cover, you need to use a J-hook. That would be my advice to you. Or you're gonna get a lot of this, and a lot of this, and a lot of that. Yes, sir? How long do you sit on spot for either or the I'll sit 30 to 45 minutes for flatheads. If I'm fishing in shallow cover, and the current's really nice on both sides of a root ball, and it's shallow. I mean, a lot of times, it seems like most of the time when you're gonna catch a fish on a piece of cover, it seems to happen more times than not in the first 10 minutes. But it happens enough to me 20 or 30 minutes in that I like to give it 30 to 40 minutes. When I do a guide trip, the last thing I wanna do is take a guy out, sit on one or two pieces of cover for six or eight hours, and maybe catch one fish when I can move and hit 12 or 13 anchors and maybe catch four, five, six flatheads, okay? I like to run and gun. I, I know 
a lot of people's idea of flathead fishing is going out, finding a hole, sitting on it, putting your baits in it, sitting all night. Again, absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's, they enjoy catfishing, right? They enjoy sitting in their boat, having a drink, maybe a bush teeny, maybe a, you know, a, a little kamikaze, a little whatever, you know, whatever. And they, there's nothing wrong with any of that. that. In fact, that's the essence of catfishing that is so freaking wonderful. Okay, we're not to the point yet, we don't have to sit there and cast and retrieve and cast and retrieve and, and cast and retrieve. We don't have to do that. We want to sit for 12 hours and, and sit there with our bait in the water, we can do that, that's okay, and we'll catch a big fish every once in a while. You know, we're just trying to improve your odds of catching these big flathead more often, that's all. Yes, sir? I hook all my baits behind the dorsal fin towards the rear of the bait, depending on how large they are, how deep I go. I want to hook them as thin as I can, okay? And which brings me to a point that I kind of forgot when we were talking about boat placement or even if you're bank fishing. You know, they say that catfish are so sensory perceptive, you got to be quiet, right? Well, that, this, this is another point that I bring up that's really kind of dumb. I mean, it really is. You get a bunch of dr drunk hillbillies slopping around in the river, you know, spitting tobacco, drinking beer, running up down, and they stick their hand in a hole, and the damn fish don't run nowhere. It just bites them and comes out of the hole, right? But you're telling me that if I'm up there in the boat talking to my wife, I'm going to scare all the catfish away. I'm not saying you need to do jumping jacks and, you know, juggle 10-pound weights and drop down. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it's not like you've got to try and be the Pink Panther, you know. It, but I like, to, when I'm throwing big baits, obviously I do not want to throw them 40 yards or 40 feet even, okay? Because I want to hook them thin. I want them to stay on. I want to be close. I don't want to throw them any further than where, you know, the guys with the catfish hats on, and that's pushing it. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, that guy right there. I don't want, I really don't even want to throw him that far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run up way high of my cover, and you're going to carry a little, because you're, if, listen, flathead fish, you're going to do a little work. You're going to catch your bait. You're going to keep your, your alive. You're going to do your homework. You're going to find this submerged cover. You're going to do a little work. But the reward, I mean, listen, if you, if you can hold a 40 or 50 pound flathead in your hand, and you're not shaken and excited, then you don't belong in the world that I live in. And I'm not saying, I mean, these fish are amazing. They're absolutely amazing fish. Amazing, again, I like them more than I like people. Get way up above your cover, get a lot of anchor rope, float back, get up on that cover, get them big baits right where you want them. Put two baits on the front of that cover, Get two baits, throw them out to the side, let the current and the bait itself work that into the cover, down the log a little bit on the limbs. Now you've got four baits on that log, that singular piece of cover. If he's there, you know what I'm saying? If your, your butthole ain't puckering then, boy, you got a problem. You ought to be all kinds of excited about what's about to happen. It's going to go down. And you might, it ain't going to happen every time. And you're going to catch a six pounder sometimes where you thought you'd catch a 60 pounder, right? But when it happens, when you do all your homework, you find that log, you get your big baits where they need to be and you catch that big one, brother, you're going to walk in your house like you're married to four supermodels, like you got your big old truck out in the driveway and gold chains. I mean, you're going to be strutting around, posting stuff on the internet about, look at me, I'm ready to be on a pro staff. And if you don't feel that way, you know, take up crappie fishing or something else, something leisurely that you can do really finesse and pretty. You know, there's something for everybody. But these fish are amazing fish. And when you do it right and you catch them, you know, I'm telling you, you do, every, you do all that homework and you catch one, sir, you're, the only thing you'll be thinking about is doing it again. I can promise you that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Okay, my, my, my thoughts on selective harvest are as follows. I choose to not kill flatheads, period. Again, I like flatheads more than people. There's several people in this building I'd probably rather choke than a flathead. Okay? That's just me. But am I gonna, am I gonna look down on you if you decide to take an eight pounder home and eat? No. Uh, channel cats? Channel cats to me, when I wanna eat channel cats, I can go out and catch enough channel cats where I can keep males. And I'll, keep, I'll try to keep 10 male channel cats. And that's two meals for me and my wife. And when they're gone, maybe I'll go catch 10 more. But I hear people talking about they gotta rotate stock because the new fishing season's come up and they got so many fish in there from last year. What? I don't, that doesn't, I don't understand that. I've kept my share of fish in my time. And again, when I touch on the big fish thing, you cannot, you cannot call somebody out, tell them their wife's ugly, threaten to beat up their kids and them if you see them keeping a big fish. You lose the chance when you do that to forever change that person's view on why you keep, why you shouldn't keep a big fish. You need to befriend that person, encourage them, explain to them why you do it. And just maybe one out of five, two out of five, you'll change. But listen, a flathead catfish can lay 38, 40,000 eggs in the spawn, okay? Or more, depending on body size. If you convince a guy to start letting his big fish go, and he catches three or four big flatheads this summer, and that one guy lets those three or four big fish go, you have changed the future of that body of water. You, have, you are responsible for 10 more or 20 more trophy fish in the future just because you changed his views. But if you go calling him a dickhead because you heard him, because you call him all names under the sun, He's gonna he's gonna keep them out of spite. So what I what I try to do is encourage those people and, and befriend them, and everyone that I can convert to see why, because these same people will tell you not to put a knife to a big pregnant walleye in the in, in the spring or the winter, you know, and that's I get that too. Walleye is what they're passionate about. They want them big females to breed, right? Why can't they see that in the flat in the in the catfish world too? We want our big females in the water to breed as well. So that's, that's my view on, on uh, CPR. Yes, sir? Live bait versus cut bait? Yeah, live bait versus cut bait. You know, cut bait is, a, is also a great option for flatheads, okay? There's times and places and there's things that we don't know. And this is what I love about people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say this with a little emphasis. We only know tendencies. We do not know what really is going on three, four foot below the surface. We don't know. There are years where it seems like they are on cut bait and there's nothing different with the water than the year before when it was all about live bait. It's just one of them. I'm just going to chalk that up. It's just one of them things. But when I go out targeting flatheads, I'm throwing live bait first. Now when the water starts to cool, back into the mid 60s, low 60s, okay? Then I'm thinking smaller live baits and more cut baits. As their metabolism drops, okay? They're looking for something easier to digest, something smaller. But at the peak of the metabolism, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to catch them on live baits just because I think that's cool. I love throwing a big live bait out there catching a big fish with it. Would you uh, take that same approach in the springtime? Absolutely. Start with cut baits, small live baits, and then work your way up the scale. As you start to catch more fish, work your way up the scale. And as soon as they start eating five, six, seven inch baits, then just balls to the wall, baby. Yep. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I never run a clicker. I never run a clicker because I don't want them to get the bait in their belly. And if that costs me a fish every once in a while, then I'm okay with that. I want 
I want to see that pop on the rod. I want to pick that rod up in my hand. I want them to pump me down until my rod's horizontal with the water, and then I set hook. I've done it the same way for 25 years. I've missed a few fish here and there, but I haven't got, I can count on one hand how many fish I've gut hooked. And that's why I just do it that way. And like I said, again, if it costs me a fish every once in a while because he ain't got it all the way in his mouth, I'm okay with that. Sometimes flatheads do that. They like to kill baits, play with their food. They squeeze them and they move them and they're not actually eating them, but you know, that's okay. I'm okay with that. Again, you don't always win. You know, sometimes they win. And those are the days when, okay, cool. What's up? What's up, Mr. Chris? That's a great question because it, it applies to more than just bridge pilings. It applies to everything else a lot. You know, a lot of people that I get on guide trips are fishing has them stymied and they're doing everything right. It's not like you're, I'm smarter or any other guide or anybody else is smarter. It's amazing how much people that get in your boat actually know and they're just missing it. They're anchoring behind the cover, they're anchoring, they're, they're just. They're just off a little bit. The difference between, between being a real consistent fisherman and struggling is a, is a small line. You know, it's, it's, a very, it's a very small line, but um, you want to fish, you always want to be in front of that cover. Okay, now there's a time and a place. I got known for a lot when I was young. I like to pull my boat up into log jams and I like to get out and walk on the log jams and drop baits down through the holes. Okay, again, there's days when the aggressive fish are up on the front of that cover. There's also days when there's fish that'll eat that are back in that cover. So, but the bridge pilings, yeah, I would like to have two baits on the front, two baits on the side, and then if you can't get them on, in one anchor, you know, but I would like to fish the front, the middle, and the rear of that, you know, on those bridge pilings, if I could. He could be laying anywhere. Typically, if you catch a big aggressive one off one of them pilings, that big aggressive fish, when you catch him the next time, will be in the same place. I caught tagged fish nine years apart on the Rock River, 10 feet apart from each other. Now I know there's been a lot of studies done on migration and stuff. Migration is kind of relative to the water, the system they're in. Some flatheads have no choice. They live in a 20 mile pool of water. They're never gonna move. And listen, in those small and medium sized rivers, if you can find a place for a flathead to winter, have cover, and eat, and spawn, he doesn't ever need to leave. That's all he wants to do. But if you've got a flat, you've got a ledge, you've got a hole, you've got two big logs in it, you've got some... Why in the heck would he go 30 yards? Just, I'm just going to go out for a swim? I mean... You know, but I mean, there has been studies done in some of your bigger river systems in Mississippi where they, some flatheads have traveled a long ways. But more studies have been done that indicate that they don't move a lot. So, but again, I, I know I kind of got off your subject, but I answered your question on bridge pillars. I don't want you coming up to a booth later saying, you didn't answer my question, because I, I ain't putting up with that. Any other questions? That's a great, man, you guys are asking some good questions. I am anti-broom pull. Again, you'll have some people tell you that, man, you gotta have that, we gotta have that, and I'm only doing this Southern voice because it's a particular individual that I hear say this all the time, and I think he's ridiculous. So I, he goes, man, you got to have yourself one of them heavy poles, and you need, you gotta have 100 pound braid, and you need one of them great big 10 on, and one of them big 10 thick, thick wire 10 on hooks. And man, that thing takes off now. You just pull that sucker out of there. If I want to do that, I'm just going to buy a battery and some leads. And you might just shock the fish and have them float to the top because that's not fishing. I mean, I thought hooking a fish and letting the rod bend and using your drag and fighting that fish to the boat 
that's all the fun in the whole dang thing. If you ain't going to do it that way, just get a commercial fishing license and catch them on a, in a net. Why in the hell you want to just drag fish off the bottom for anyway? So, to answer that question, you t I get a little emotional sometimes. You know what I'm saying? I'm a little pissy. But, as you'll see, this is a medium fast. Most people expect that flathead catfish being a big bruiser, you know, if they're going to take a rod and they're going to double it tip to tip, and that's just not what they do most of the time. Most of the time you get a quick slap on the end of the rod, and then the rod tips over slowly. And it's just kind of a stop and go, stop and the reason, does anybody know why that is? That's because a flathead catfish swims head first. They don't swim tail first, they move their head. So when their head moves, and then it stops, and then it goes, okay? That's why that happens. Little fact there. Anybody know what melanin is? Melanin. Melanin is a chemical that the flatheads have that allows them to change the color of their skin to blend into their surroundings. They're not accidentally yellow or green or brown or black. They do that because where they hunt, on the bottom, somewhere, that's the color that blends them in the best. Again, these are magnificent animals. If people did a little more study and they wouldn't even think about keeping some of these fish they're keeping. They're magnificent animals. But anyway, they're typically a light biter. Typically. I mean, sometimes you go get one, but, but I love that tip. I want to be able to... You'll get used to the way a bluegill moves. You'll get used to the way a shad moves. You'll get used to the way a moon eye moves, a carp. When you run each bait enough, you'll get used to the way they move. And when a flathead swallows them, that movement all changed. It comes to a halt, and then it's, hold on to my belt loop, mama, I think I got one. I answer it, probably got, we got that, okay. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. So, that Yes. Yes, it does react differently. And one of the biggest pleasures of my life was being able to have the owners of the offshore tackle in the boat and have a flathead take a planer board down one day. It was amazing. Uh, the planer board literally just stands up. It's almost like a, the Titanic going down. It stands up and then it just... And if somebody could play the theme from Jaws when that happened in your boat, when that was happening, it would be like the coolest thing ever. But it's really neat. And again, if you're moving, if you're dragging those planer boards and they grab one, it would be a different scenario, right? Because you're moving the bait. So they're gonna be moving to grab it. You know, they're smart. Flathead are smart. They, they don't wanna chase their bait if they don't have to. They will to survive, but they don't want to. Just like me. I want my wife to bring me dinner. She's not always gonna do that. But she does do it a lot. But I'm just saying, you know, you know, so that's that, the way that is. Any other questions? What size and brand hook do you prefer? If I'm gonna run circle hooks, which I will only run circle hooks if I'm moving again. And then to me, when you're moving, you're not targeting flatheads, because that's just not typical. I would run flathead fever circle hooks. But this hook right here. This is a seven knot hook. A lot of people are gonna say this is way too small to hook a 17 inch shad and catch a 50 pound flathead. Well, I got a bunch of pictures that'll prove all you wrong. I've caught probably 13, 1400 flatheads on this style of hook. It's just an offset. It's called a sickle hook, okay? J hooks. There's some good J-hooks out there. Tackling Cat sells a good J-hook. Um, so if I'm gonna run a J-style hook, it's, gonna, it's this sickle right here. If you wanna see it there, you can order them on the internet and whatnot, but they're not, this hook has been a very good hookup for me. You like that clicker on that recon? You gotta come down to the casking booth, check that stuff out. Yes, sir. To catch the big baits? I, 
I poke, dude, I'm poking and hoping and praying just like everybody else. You know, because shatter, there ain't, bait's more frustrating than catching fish. I never seen anything that frustrate a man, make you want to rip your skin off more than bait. I mean, you could catch, you go out one day, you know, throw your net once, you got enough bait to use for 10 months. Then the next three days, you can't find a piece of bait nowhere, you know, and, but uh, I said, with the good Lord's interventence, if I could use a certain bait, it would be 15 to 20 inch shad, followed by live moon eye and live carp. Uh, I like bluegills and bullheads. I like them more around the spawn time. Uh, they're more known as a bait robber. And I believe a lot of times during the spawn, some of your male flatheads, they won't eat a bait, they just kill them. Uh, I don't really like to catch males once they're guarding a the bed, but when you get heavy pre-spawn and stuff and it's just starting to slow down, I like to use bullheads and, and bluegills then. But. As cut bait? As whole bait, no, I, I don't think so. They're, again, as a cut bait for flatheads, when the water temperature gets that hot, I love moon eye and skipjack as a cut bait. I don't care for them too much as a live bait. They're, they're just not as active when the water gets that warm as they are when the water's cooler. That's when I prefer the shadow still move. Uh, and then, you know, carp, I love carp. Small, small carp are great. You know, up to two pound, up to about a pound, pound and a half carp. Good. You know, that, that's the biggest reaction you get for somebody that's that doesn't flathead fish and they come on a trip. The first time you hook up a 15-inch bait, they look at you like you are the biggest dummy. I mean, they, they, I've, I've had some people look at me. I mean, they, they, they don't believe that they're going to catch anything on that. Now, I've caught plenty of six and seven pound flathead on a 15 inch bait or 14 inch bait. I mean, if they can get it in their mouth, they'll eat it. They'll find a way to eat it. You know, any other questions? Yes, sir. He was 50, 52, I think. That was the first, that was the first big flathead I had ever caught on a rod and reel. Uh, I had caught a lot of flatheads up to 10 or 12. That was about 22, 23 years ago. And once I caught that fish, there was, there was just, there was nothing else swimming for me. I mean, I still go channel catfish and I still fish for blues and, but I was hooked then. So I've caught, I've been fortunate to catch a lot bigger than that, but uh, that was the one that got me started. No, I had it for years and I lost it. Uh, I would have still liked to have had it, but it is what it is. Any other questions? What's that? I do like using creek chubs. The, the big reason why I don't use creek chubs is because I can't hold on to them little, I mean them things, you want to have a bait get in your boat and just flat piss you off? I mean, that's a creek chub, a creek chub will piss you off. If you have never been angry in your boat, Go get 10 creek chubs, don't take a bait net with you, and by the time you get that thing on a hook, you'll be pissed off. I promise you. So give, give, give that a try this summer if you ain't, and then give me a call back and say, you're right, man, I've never been mad at my boat. Hell, I stopped fishing. <laughs> Suckers are great too, absolutely. And I, and I kind of missed the whole sucker thing. I was talking to Cart, but yeah, suckers are great. That it, everybody? Well, I appreciate y'all a bunch for listening to me ramble on. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the campus conference.